Okay, so after looking at New Testament Volume 1 through the Imaginary Fest game, here I am back with some more Genesis Testament trying to pick back up on this. And yes, I do have, yeah, because someone just sent me a link to New Testament Volume 3, so I'll look at that through the game as well. But for now, yeah, just get back into some Aeon real quick. Yeah, because it's like I haven't watched him in like a good two, three weeks now. So yeah, I'm going to just give you guys a good video of him real quick. And then after that, yeah, move on back to that Imaginary Fest. Yeah, looking at the story through all of that because yeah i did enjoy looking at that i did want a, at least a little bit more animation or something or illustration but still it's fine they were at least able to tell the story pretty well there and um it was still pretty enjoyable to watch but other than that hope you guys will enjoy this make sure you like subscribe and let's get this reaction started what's up guys a and horace here back with my genesis testament 4 review slash thoughts video so I'll be dropping my thoughts on the new volume of Index as it has just been fully translated by JS06, so massive kudos to him. Just before we start the video, I just want to mention that in the previous video I made about how magic works in Index, that I would make a, a similar video with what to do with science and Esper powers, how Esper powers actually work at 3,000 subscribers. So. If you can help me get to 3,000 subscribers, that'd be a massive help to the channel. So please consider supporting the channel to help us grow further if you enjoy the Index and Railgun series. With that out of the way, I want to talk about the volume itself now. And this volume was decent. It wasn't the best volume of the Index, um, but it wasn't terrible either. It was somewhere in the middle. But overall, I really enjoyed the volume. This volume definitely felt like a build-up volume, one that is building up to a giant climax right at the end, so I'm looking forward to reading the climax of where this story is going. And once that is written, once we do have that climax, I think it will improve my opinion of this volume looking back in retrospect. So this volume had a mystery vibe, kind of similar to New Testament 16, where there was a massive heat wave going out through Academy City. But instead, we have the reverse of that in Los Angeles with a massive cold wave with temperatures of minus 30 degrees. Combined with the fact that the entire population of LA, around 30 million people, have gone completely missing. So Toma and Style and Kanzaki get sent to investigate and to attack RNC Occultics HQ, who they believe is behind the disappearances. I feel like the environmental changes in this volume were better handled than the ones in New Testament 16, since I feel like that volume was just an excuse to get all the characters in swimsuits, and this volume actually felt like yeah, just an excuse for uh, fan servers. Stakes in the story, I felt like the prologue was a perfect introduction for showing us how dangerous this new environment in LA can be by following an American civilian who falls victim to the mysterious disappearing magic so yeah style and kazaki make their return in this volume and it's also great to have them back as their interactions with toma are really interesting and fun uh, while kazaki does get taken out by the sand magic early in the volume uh, she still has a decent amount of screen time which is good enough for her character and style is definitely one of the best characters in this volume as the volume progresses and the mystery unravels itself, it is revealed that a magician called Shinitaz is defending the RNC Occultics HQ and is behind the disappearances in Los Angeles. Okay, that's, so that's something takes right the there. Form of Melzebeth Grocery, the company executive of Space Engage who has gone missing in Los Angeles, who actually made a partnership with RNC Occultics. A large portion of the volume is arguing if. Melzebeth was actually a good person or not. Style arguing that she is a bad person who willingly cooperated with RNC Occultics, while Toma believes that she's a good person who was forced to. While it is enjoyable to see Style's cynical nature, I must admit it was kind of obvious that Toma would be proven right, in my opinion. Like, I don't think any of the clues pointed to Melzebeth being an actual bad person. Well, that's just my opinion. So I feel like the mystery was almost a bit too obvious at times in this volume. Our team of heroes also come across uh, the daughter of Melzebeth, Elkalia, and she has been taken hostage in the city 
as of course Melzebeth was a good person and she had to cooperate with uh, Anna Sprengel and RNC Occultics because she had to protect her daughter and once she was no longer needed she was turned into sand by the sand magic used by Suchinitas. From the cover you may think Helcalia will have a big role in this volume but to be honest she's mostly in the background and doesn't really do or say much. Most of her dialogue goes through Terma's translator pen which translates index in like a google translate way. While it was kind of amusing at first it kind of oh, she got an interesting in design at least in this yeah like what she got on her um hair right there that blue it looked like a blueberry like well yeah Helcalia didn't really have much motivation you're okay family name is grocery that conflict was interesting at first but it didn't really last very long to be honest and she quickly just disappeared for the volume like in the last section or chapter so yeah overall Helcalia wasn't the greatest character by any stretch, so that part was definitely disappointing since she was seen to have been an important role, but she wasn't. And the main emotional drive of the volume is meant to be the relationship between Helcalia and Melzebeth, you know, the mother and daughter relationship, but we don't really see them interact until the end when they're reunited, so we can't really resonate that much emotionally with Helcalia, how she feels about her mother, since we've never seen them interact before. It's just hey, here's a girl who we need to help out, who we feel sorry for, so let's do it. And put her mind at ease that her mother is not saying Okay, so I see what he means. Like, not too interesting, but you know, interesting enough, at it's least. It's because of a technology known as the Logistic Hornets. And I think these Logistic Hornets are pretty cool in design and function. So they're meant to take people into space, but they can also influence the environment around them, which is how the cold wave starts in Academy City. And these environmental conditions are also necessary for Suchinitas to use their magic. So it's a combination of both magic and science, which I find really interesting. And Kamachi does go into a lot of depth about how these two powers function together, which I really appreciated. We later find out the motivation for building the Logistic Hornets, which was to give Helcalia, the daughter, who is very young, a wedding in space. And this was the father's idea who was deceased and Melzebeth decided to turn it into a reality. Now, I don't know if this was a wedding planned for the future. I think it may have been, but still, it's kind of a weird motivation that I couldn't really get behind. I mean, to be fair, they are an Indian family and arranged marriages and stuff like that are a thing. But yeah, at the same time, it's like, I can't really get behind that motivation at all. Uh, so that's definitely another minus for the characters in this volume. So yeah, the main problem I have this volume is that the all the new characters that were introduced weren't likeable, really. I mean, that wasn't the case in Genesis Testament 3, since literally majority of the cast that were introduced were likeable in some way or form. But it's the opposite of this volume, like almost none of them were anything special or likeable in my opinion, which is a shame. But at least the old characters definitely stood out. One interesting thing about this volume was that there were three like sub stories okay. concurrently with the main story we had in Los Angeles. So we had Roberto Katze in Washington DC. Then we had the worldwide commotion with the sisters, the Misaka clones, which did tie in with Roberto Katze as well, and also Accelerator's Trial. In fact, they all tied. Uh, each other together and also tied into the main story at the end too which was nice to see it's nice to see these stories weren't here just for the sake of it and it all tied into what was going on in the volume so due to accelerator's trial which is currently going on since he has confessed to murdering 10,000 Misaka clones he is now revealed to the world that these clones actually exist and are scattered across the world so the world is currently debating whether Makoto clones are human or have a right to exist. And then Dion Fortune convinces Accelerator to uh, allow the clones to be used in the attack on Los Angeles. Dion believes this is the best way to get the sisters to have true legitimacy and acceptance in the modern world. Okay, um, yeah. So threatening accelerator. Make it to where, yeah, they could be like heroes or something, Shinage like you show their worth. He was uh, almost killed in the previous volume. 
And really, their conversation was one of the highlights of the volume for me. It was really good, and it was great to see Dion giving Accelerator some facts, since Accelerator is being a bit too hard on himself. I know he did some terrible things in the past, but the world really needs Accelerator, as Anna Sprengel is a massive threat to the world right now, and honestly, it'd be better for Accelerator to be putting his power to be doing some good instead of uh, taking a prison sentence or even being sentenced to death, since Japan still has the death sentence. So in the next volume, we could see Accelerator on his way to the gallows. Obviously, Accelerator is not going to die, and hopefully oh, yeah, he not that, no. change his mind once Anna Sprengel's plan does come into actual motion. Meanwhile, Roberto Katze is uh, under pressure over the Operation Overlord Revenge, which is the operation led by Academy City and the Anglican Church to stop um, the RNC occultics in Los Angeles. So he is under pressure for allowing the foreign force to be allowed into America, but he had his reason for doing so, as it would be probably a bigger controversy if he asked American troops to turn on fellow Americans. He is debating against his political opponents and his vice president, Darius. Hughes. I'm just still trying to figure out what's like, I'm more focused on the right than the left. Like, the I had just come to that. that. They have a right to exist like anyone else would have who is human, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, etc. Meanwhile, we do get a scene with Makoto with her phone going crazy since everyone is reacting to the news of the clones existing and her panicking over what Kuroko will think. So I'm excited to see what the connotations are for the clones going public will be in the future volumes. Oh yeah, and we got a bit of Makoto and Shoko this volume, not an awful lot, but a tiny amount, but still, I don't get why. I feel like Kamachi is just shilling them into every volume as of late, like, is this just to satisfy the Railgun fans since, I don't know, Makoto definitely deserve to be in this volume but Shokoho I'm not quite sure and I say that as someone who loves Shokoho like she's my favorite girl in the series but yeah even in Old Testament we didn't have Mikoto in every volume but now I feel like we're getting both of them in nearly every volume that's coming out nowadays I don't think they were in Genesis Testament 3 but literally every other volume as of late like the late volumes in New Testament and now the early volumes in Genesis Testament we're just getting Misaka and Shokoho, even if the duo itself doesn't really have anything to do with the actual plot going on in the volume. But I'd like to see that change and give some other characters a spotlight, because it's kind of getting crazy now how much Kamachi is shilling this pairing. It is later revealed that Darius, the vice president, is in fact the bad guy, Citrinitas, but he's using a double uh, in Washington DC while he debates with Roberto Katze while the real Citrinitas is disguised as Melzabeth and that weird doll gimp dog thing. <laughs> yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever that is right there. there. To discredit and shame Melzabeth. Darius wasn't an amazing villain by any stretch. He was quite one-dimensional. He was just jealous that Roberto Katze, like a complete idiot, like <laughs> a crazy-ass American guy who just is pretty honest about his feelings and wasn't very educated, but still became president, climbed above him, and he basically wanted to um, use RNC politics to bring his ideal version of America and basically assume power for himself. So yeah, pretty one-dimensional politician, villain. Uh, not much more needs to be said. But again, Index doesn't really have many one-dimensional villains apart from some of the Kiharas and a few other villains here and there. A lot of them are multi-dimensional. I mean, at least it's good to have it's like just any type, right? Whether, whether it's a petty... Yeah, excuse Roberto petty like um, motivation or whatever. It's ever. like, like Jesus, he had no chill might as well have it all. But it was honestly refreshing to see, and he was a blast in every scene. Although the I feel like the shotgun thing that was going on was a bit too crazy for even me. Like I was thinking, really, he just pulled out a shotgun like during a press conference to the world, like and is battling with the vice president with shotguns. Like that was a bit too crazy even for me, but. I still appreciated it, like, <laughs> although I found it kind of weird how none of them got shot, like, they both were just battling with these shotguns and none of them got hit even once. That was a bit strange to me. But yeah, uh, apart from that, like, Berto was completely batshit crazy. He's definitely a chaotic good character uh, in terms of his alignment 
But yeah, he kind of reminds me of some presidents as of late who are really like American in terms of how over the top and audacious they are. But Roberto is a good person at heart, so we'll forgive him. Sadly, the end fight scene wasn't anything special. It wasn't the best fight at all, which is a shame. But I feel like the mystery aspect of the volume was definitely the main draw rather than it being an action heavy volume and the Makoto clones did spring into action against a 5 over modeled off accelerator but I don't think we actually saw that fight which is disappointing since they, they showed the illustration of it but we didn't really get a proper scene of them fighting it it kind of just like went away plus I missed it did I miss it you tell me the ending of this volume though was pretty goddamn good I mean I didn't really care much for Melzebeth and Helcalia getting that reunion. Okay, it was satisfying just to see the conclusion of the main plot line, but the juicy stuff happened after that. From this volume, we can definitely feel the political world of Toaru changing uh, as Accelerator receives his sentence. Obviously, we don't know what sentence he's going to get. It's either going to be many, 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 many years behind bars, or he's going to be sentenced to death, as I previously mentioned. So yeah, I'm excited to see what happens with that. But man, the scene, you know what scene I'm going to be fanboying about. The scene with the human or demon, Alistair Crowley. Of course. Okay. Alistair just went full, no chill, just complete savage in this volume. And oh my god, this guy or girl is completely just... The GOAT. That's just the only way to describe Alistair. Alistair effectively storms RNC Occultics HQ and just murders everyone by himself. And once he gets to the room of like the company executives, he fucking tortures them to death. Like he sprays this water gun on them, which puts this uh, fluid on, which attracts these modif genetically modified flies that basically put eggs into your body that basically oh no that's inside by turning them that's into crazy them. and while that is going on he also makes them unable to move by passing this allergen through the air and he starts to carve away at them with a letter opener as they are a completely vulnerable like how brutal can you get like that is fucking zero chill alistair that is that is definitely probably the most gruesome and disturbing things alistair has ever done in the series because usually he's doing cruel shit behind the scenes and you know being the puppet master but this time we get to see him actually doing some cruel shit himself and that was next level like he wanted to send a message to anna sprengel and i think he goddamn did he uh, yeah the volume, did something understand what anna sprengel's plan was by having the 30 million people disappear in Los Angeles. It was essentially meant to act as a bait because Anna Sprengel wanted RNC Occultics to be destroyed in order to spread unrest and riots throughout the world. So the disappearances was basically forcing the world powers to intervene and force them to take out RNC Occultics to get these riots to take place. And it'll be interesting to see what Anna Sprengel will do due to this chaos and civil unrest at big corporations like RNC Occultics as a result of what's happened. And Anna Sprengel is working in tandem with other Rosicrucian magicians, although we don't know a lot about them. One of them is called uh, Arcadia, I think, and another one is called Alice, but we don't know anything about them yet, so we'll have to wait and see until what happens. But yeah, I think Alistair may have predicted what Anna was doing, that it was just bait, but RNC cultics needed to be dealt with anyway, even if it was bait or whatever, uh, a trap. It still needs to be taken out by someone. So, yeah, Alistair is basically declaring war on Anna Sprengel at this moment in time. He's basically said, Anna, I'm here. I'm ready to kill you. Let's get onto this. So, Alistair seems to be putting his plan into motion. I don't know what Alistair is planning, uh, but we'll have to wait and see. So, I'm really fucking hyped to see Anna and Alistair clash. And you bet I'm Team Alistair. Alistair, you better not job to this. You better fucking win. If you don't, I'll be disappointed. <laughs> and yeah, I think next volume might be an Anna and Alistair volume, but I can also probably see Toma getting involved with Accelerator next volume. But 
Um, that might be later on in the story, we don't know yet, but that's what I'd like to see next volume anyway. But yeah, overall, I'll give this volume a 7 out of 10. I feel like it was a good volume, but there were a few flaws here and there, and there are a few things. Which is like kind of basic, basically. Me, like It is a build up volume. Yeah, nothing too great, something too bad, just yeah, kind of in the, in the middle. Better events, I imagine. Uh, but what it did do was develop the political world of Toaru, so I can't wait to see where it goes in the future. Thank you for watching this video. Next, I'll be doing a Toaru podcast discussing this volume in more detail with three or four others, so stay tuned for that on the channel. And yeah, thanks for watching, and I will see you all next time. Bye-bye. Okay, and that is it for this one. So, yeah, just a good 7 out of 10. Yeah, I understand. I actually was literally thinking that, too. I was like, nah, I don't think 6 out of 10. I think it'd be at least 7 out of 10. So, I guess the most interesting, or not even interesting, just the most chaotic thing that happened was Alistair within this uh, volume here. Yeah, so he just yeah went completely off from what I'm hearing. Flies that can just lay eggs inside of you yeah okay and then I'm like cutting or carving whatever with a letter will be like okay yeah we're, we're just gonna leave that somewhere else yeah just um you know push that aside real quick yeah, that's something else but yeah i kind of see what he means so yeah fights that's just kind of like you know it looks interesting but at the same time it's like nothing too much and then um what do you say the vice president yeah just not really the greatest motivation of doing this here and whatever yeah, whatever this puppet doll is i don't even know what's going on with that but yeah there you go then uh was it the president here this guy was it uh roberto okay yep commander in chief of the american armed forces so yeah whatever type of weird motivation that uh the vice president had here you're yeah, nothing just too crazy nothing to where it's like oh like okay this story like you know it's nothing like that uh then of course you got these two doing whatever let me see let's see did you mess with kuriko's brain then uh logical brainwashing can't make someone act like that okay so whatever they got going on there then yeah, kind of like a good idea here. Like yeah, you don't want them to go back to yeah getting experiments and all that. Yeah, all this work being done towards them. Like yeah, try and show that they can be like heroes or someone something good. You know, actually something useful compared to just being like yeah just clones. You know, being something useful. And yeah, they could even I don't even know help at convenience stores or something. I I don't even know, but. Yeah, they can definitely help out a lot. It doesn't have to just be fighting or something. Yeah, they can help out, like, society in general. Helping, not, well, I don't know about driving. <laughs> I was just about to say that. No, I don't know about that. But like I said, at the store, just, I don't even know, helping people with groceries or something. Um, and then, yeah, you can just move on from there. And then, speaking of groceries, <laughs> come on now. No, I would not want my last name to be that um i know there's definitely even weirder last names but come on no but you got two new characters and then what's her name helcalia and then uh melzabeth so just two new characters in los angeles and you said it was indian okay so you got that and then the i think was a motivation for a wedding or a marriage so yeah probably like tie into that since yeah you already have arranged marriages and all that with indian in general so yeah, it, it would make sense, but yeah, so like I keep on saying, I can see where, yeah, there really wasn't too much, because yeah, I even forgot that they were even, I guess, the main part of this after he kept on uh, moving on. I'm like, okay, yeah, they seem like they're like the main thing that we're trying to like save or something important that's, you know, going on surrounding them. So basically, yeah, if Tom was supposed to be ta saving them, it's like, okay, yeah, they're going to be the main ones. But looking at it now, it's like, okay, yeah, we do get that last part. So, I mean, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it gets uh, reunited and all, but, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's like, really didn't, didn't see too much going on with them here. Uh, well, yeah, and then this was cool, too. Kanzaki uh, style. So, you got that. Actually, let me see this. Let's see. Leave, leave everything to your big sister. Girls in swimsuits everywhere. Let's see. Okay, I was just trying to see 
type of interaction they was having here. And then, yeah, you had, instead of it being just real hot, no, it's just real cold now, to where it's like, yeah, you, you don't even want to be outside. Shoot, I, I don't even know if the inside is safe. It's just going to be that cold. But overall, I mean, this volume, I mean, it was, oh yeah, and then uh, I forgot about them too. I mean, it doesn't seem too bad, but yeah, just kind of see what Aeon is talking about here. Like, yeah, the characters are like, eh, and then you know, story not too great, but hey, even if it's like all one dimensional, at least we have some version of that here. It's not like everything is just so story driven. Yeah, just got the greatest story, you know, something like Authentus, right? So yeah, it's good to see it. Like, yeah, sometimes it's like, yeah, just have some downtime or something. Nothing too crazy just something simple right from uh to Ardu. because yeah that actually is good for certain anime and certain series like this like yeah if you're just having to always every like volume chapter whatever have to think like okay wait this character did this and then she had her story here this backstory there yeah, if you have to like remember all of that yeah just kind of you know is a lot on the readers and the viewers when they have to go back and be like okay yeah this was kind of already like a complicated you know concept or complicated power that they introduce and now they're adding even more you know the next volume after so just good that's something simple something chill to yeah just get you ready for that next big chapter or volume so yeah that's what i'll say about that but yeah, just end this off here. I hope you guys did enjoy. Make sure you like, subscribe again, and I'll just see you guys in the next one.